Our last talk of the track, uh, there's two more for closing the day, but our last talk of the track is going to be uh, Jens uh, Newsom, and I think I got that correct, <laughs> Uh Anyways, uh, on GraphQL meshes and the future of GraphQL and kind of where is this going. I know you gave me another title, but I'll, I'll have you introduce your other title in the uh, during your talk here, but did I get the last name right? Is it just this? Uh, the okay. correct name is Jens Neuse. Neuse, okay. Just, just like noise, make some noise. Make some noise. Make some noise for Jen, Jens. <laughs> so um, that's the start, and uh, I'll just give it over to you. Yeah, thanks. Let your slides so, come up here real quick. And then yeah, I guess I first need to share my screen. Um, maybe you can tell me if you can see that okay. That's great. Is the audio in, uh, is the audio good? You can test it real quick. I don't hear anything yet. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't hear your presentation. Your audio quality is good. Yeah, audio. Yeah, the, the presentation doesn't have any audio. OK, good. All right, good. OK, so I hide that one. Da, da, da. All right, cool. So my name is Jens. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, WindowGraph. And today uh, in this talk, I want to talk about how GraphQL can enable digital transformation. So let me just start that. All right. So about me, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I usually use the handle Jens Neuser underscore DE. So you can uh, see some of my, my comments there. Uh, I do regular announcements with wundergraph.com. And then if you haven't seen my blog post already, if you go to wundergraph.com slash blog, you can find some uh, interesting blog posts there. So yeah, have a look if you're interested. All right, so uh, today what I want to do is I want to talk about the challenges of digital transformation in the context of APIs, OK? So what I learned over the last few years is that um, there's a bunch of things that concern uh, small to medium companies, small to medium sized companies. Um, so for example, large corporations tend to have many, many APIs and it can become a burden to handle all of them. Uh, then the single source of truth, it's not always clear, like what's your schema, etc. cetera. And uh, you can have inconsistencies in your schema. Um, that's, that's a burden. Um, then there's the question of how you would handle uh, versioning and make your schema backwards compatible. And uh, maintaining legacy systems can be um, a very costly thing. So uh, you don't really know, do you need all those old systems running? Um, so that's another concern. Then um, you have to write a lot of custom middleware to keep your, your or, or to enable projects. So for example, you have a bunch of services like SOAP and RAS and gRPC, and then you want to build a new application. And you need to fetch data from those uh, three services. And usually that requires you to build a new backend for front end to fetch that data. So yeah, that's a typical problem. And then finally, uh, the business usually requires you to build fast applications. They should be secure, performant, and scalable, uh, so we need to, to have a look at that too. And today, what I'd like to do is try to analyze all of those uh, seven dots and try to figure out how GraphQL can help here. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. All right, so starting with the, with the first point, handling APIs at scale. Um, recently, we had a very interesting talk on GraphQL FM. Uh, where uh, there was the guys from Uber. They have kind of, I am i can't remember the, the correct number, but I thought it was something like 2,500 APIs. And you can imagine how hard it can actually be to build an application and figure out uh, those three or five or maybe seven services from those uh, 2,500. And how do you 
how do you bring them together and use them in a very simple and easy way to build an application on top of that? So that can be uh, really a complicated thing. But it, it's not just a problem for Uber scale, but also, uh, for example, if, if you look at uh, my past, where I work for companies with, say, 100 people, you still have something like 20 APIs. And when you start a new project, you build a new mobile application, something like that, it's always like not just REST APIs, you always have, I don't know, some XML somewhere, or I had one occurrence there. Uh, we had a partner and they send us XML data, like XML files over FTP, and then we had to read that in. Uh, so it can be quite quite complicated. So you, you yeah, you, I, I guess you get the point that uh, writing middleware uh, can be daunting. So um, what, what I was thinking is, um, what if we could decide on a common language to, to simplify the whole thing and treat APIs as artifacts. So, you know, I, I guess it would be super hard to build a developer portal where you have APIs from SOAP to REST, gRPC, and GraphQL uh, that could be very complicated to describe all of them. But maybe we, we can compromise somehow and, for example, use GraphQL as a common language to make all that manageable. And there's a few pros and cons in doing that. So for example, uh, GraphQL has been proven to be a very, very solid solution for building uh, user interfaces or hierarchical user interfaces like web apps, single page applications, mobile apps. So it's, it's a very good fit for that kind of thing. And we also have the uh, ability to combine multiple services in one coherent schema. So there's uh, currently two ways. So we have GraphQL Federation and schema stitching. So GraphQL Federation is a more decentralized approach. So the services itself, they declare uh, which types they implement and which types they extend. So for example, you have one service that's the review service, and then you have a second service that's the comments service, and the comments service can extend the reviews with another field and then add comments to reviews. Uh, that's the decentralized approach. And then you also have the centralized approach uh, that is schema stitching where you have the review service and the comment service. Both services have no clue about each other. And there is a centralized component, like for example, an API gateway that does the, the stitching. So it stitches the comments to the reviews and then that's another way. So depending on use case, uh, both are valid options. And then uh, third point is we have absolutely excellent tooling for uh, using graphical, like graphical and graphical playground. And we have various code generators, uh, like for example, from the, the guild that really help you get up to speed. Um, like you write your queries and they generate React components and hooks and all that jazz. So that really helps you. And then on the con side, there's a bunch of challenges because uh, running GraphQL in production is not that well understood compared to REST APIs. So security, scaling, and caching, that's a bunch of concerns. Uh, we will talk about that later. And then, of course, we, we don't have hypermedia with uh, hypermedia controls uh, with uh, GraphQL. So it doesn't fit well for authentication or file uploads. Um, but I think uh, it's still worth uh, using GraphQL alongside REST. So it's, it's never just GraphQL. And GraphQL will never replace everything. I will go into uh, more detail about that later. But I, I think uh, GraphQL and REST APIs and other API styles can, can uh, have a healthy relationship and solve your problems together but not exclusively. So if you're thinking to adopt GraphQL as your, uh, as your solution to build a, unify, a unified API layer, what you probably will stumble upon is the principle made uh, uh, or suggested by Apollo, and that is you should have one graph. And one graph, 
uh, when you look at it initially, it makes a lot of sense because you have that one single graph. You can write any query against this graph. It's very easy, easy to use. Uh, you can see if, if types already exist. So it's, it's very easy to handle in the beginning. But what I'd like to question is, um, how will one single graph scale? So for example, let's, let's take um, Uber as an example. Um, and, and let's just assume they have 1,000 APIs. And now think about they have, let's say, three to five um, query root fields for each service. So that would mean they have between 3,000 and 5,000 query root fields, uh, uh, root fields on the query type. Is that actually a good developer experience? And do you need access to 1,000 APIs to build a single product? I guess most probably not. Like most of the time, maybe you, you need three or five services or maybe 10, but not 1,000. So some kind of sharding would be interesting, right? And then there's third-party graphs or third-party APIs. Like let's say you have your 1,000 services and you also would like to interact with Stripe. And let's assume Stripe also has a, a graphical API. And now, will you just copy the Stripe API into your graph or wrap it, or what are you going to do? And how would you, in, in, in that situation, how would you link the graphs together? I'm not sure. Okay. And what I think could be a possible solution is that we need something like NPM or Docker for graphical schemas. So NPM lets you publish and, and install packages. Docker lets you publish containers and pull containers. But for graphical schemas, we don't have anything like that. So let's say I'm an Uber engineer and I want to build uh, a new application against three services. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could just say, I don't know, npm install XYZ, and then I get three APIs, and uh, I could automatically start an on-demand micro gateway that hosts these three APIs. And now I have a super tiny graphical API that's easy to use. It covers my use case, and I keep on working. And I don't ha have to like search through 1,000 uh, entry points on the query type. So that was uh, concern number one, Han handling uh, large scale um, um, large scale APIs. Number two and three is a uh, single source of truth and inconsistencies in the schema. Um, so if you think about it, you have REST APIs, you have SOAP APIs, GRPC, you have, I don't know, external services. If we would treat all of those APIs as artifacts, we could actually store them in some kind of system. So uh, some ideas exist, for example, uh, schema registries. And if we do something like that, we could actually uh, always store these artifacts in Git and then have some kind of continuous integration system with uh, linters uh, that could really help us enforce some, some rules. So for example, uh, we could declare a rule where we say, oh, we always want relay connections because this makes pagination a lot better and uh, uh, like retrieving long lists uh, is a, more, a, a lot more efficient uh, using relay connections. So we could have a linter that enforces this pattern. And then there's also the possibility that with the, with the linter uh, or with the CI pipeline, we could also detect breaking changes. So for example, we change the schema in some way uh, and that could always tell us that we're breaking one of our clients. And it doesn't matter if the upstream API is actually SOAP or something else, because if we turn that uh, into GraphQL, it could always tell us, okay, you're breaking something. And then of course, it can help us uh, validate against the existing schema. So uh, one company I was, uh, I was working with, they had like, they, they were a car maker and they, they had, um, seven endpoints for the type or the resource vehicle. And now you want to build something with a vehicle API and you're not really sure like 
which ones to use. And if you had, or if you treated your APIs like artifacts and you have one unified uh, API layer, you could actually have had a look into that system and analyze, oh, we already have a vehicle type. Maybe you just want to extend that and not create like the eighth vehicle type, okay? And uh, most importantly, you can run those checks beforehand, so before deploying, in order to, to avoid breaking changes, stuff like that. So that's single source of truth and inconsistencies in the schema. Uh, topic number four is versioning and backwards compatibil uh, compatibility. So we know it's, it's good practice to not break anything, but um, you know, sometimes you just want to break something because you want to move forward. And sometimes you have clients, like for example, IoT devices, which you can never update. So maybe it would be beneficial for the business if you could actually introduce breaking changes without really breaking something. And a possible solution here is to use persisted queries, okay? So persisted queries is a very simple concept introduced like almost from the beginning with, um, uh, with the Relay client because the, the Relay compiler, um, they, 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 when Facebook introduced GraphQL, they always, like from the beginning, they compiled the queries. Uh, and that means they, they created a hash for each query and then stored that query on the server. So with that concept, what you could actually do is um, instead of trying to use the, the deprecated uh, directive, which makes a lot of sense and you can do that, it's a good option. What you could also do is default to persisted queries. And what that enables you is, whenever you run something in uh, in development, you just use the regular queries. And the moment you uh, you go with your deployment into production, you persist all the queries in some way and store them alongside with, for example, a timestamp. And that kind of gives you a snapshot of that moment in time so that you will always remember this client has a certain expectation how the schema looked like at that point in time. And it's like you, you create an RPC and you know exactly, because GraphQL has a schema, you know exactly what the client expects. The, the, the contract between client and server is fixed. So even after that, if you change your schema, what you can do is you can always remember this metadata uh, you change the schema, for example, you rename a field and you will always know all you have to do is build a middleware that takes this old request, renames a field, and once you get the response back from a server, we just map one field name in the JSON response so that the client gets exactly the data they expect. So with that pattern, you could actually enable to uh, enable API consumers and API producers to, to drive at a different pace. So if, if, you, uh, if you decide to break something, just break it, write those middlewares and uh, keep going. And ideally, and that's what we're uh, doing at Wondergraph, ideally you, you wouldn't really have to do that much and there is a system that handles it for you. And this is what we're like, one of the things we're doing. So that's versioning and backwards compatibility. Uh, the next one is maintaining legacy. So when you have a, uh, a heterogeneous system of services like REST, SOAP, gRPC, and whatever you find, all the databases, uh, it's really hard to actually figure out um, if anybody is still using this and that old system. And if you have a, a way to automatically onboard your existing infrastructure, onto this unified GraphQL layer, what you get is a way to analyze each and every system in a very, very detailed way. Because one unique feature of GraphQL is due to the nature of the queries, we always know which of the fields and types on one of the services we are querying. So even if behind the scenes there's a SOAP service with just a GraphQL wrapper on top, if we have that unified GraphQL layer, we will always 
have detailed information uh, if we're still using that SOAP service. And maybe there's just one field uh, that we're stitching to the schema with that SOAP service, and maybe we can replace it. Uh, so it, in that case, this unified uh, API layer can, can really help you reduce maintenance costs because you're able to, to uh, very easily shut down systems that you're no longer using. On the other hand, if you try to do a similar thing uh, with a heterogeneous uh, uh, chaotic system, I think it would be really hard to figure out uh, or to, to implement uh, logging and analytics for like all your various uh, systems with different protocols, etc. So that's maintaining legacy. Uh, number six is custom middleware. So uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, one of the projects I was working on, uh, we had the requirement to take data from a uh, from a data provider, and they send this data as XML uh, onto an FTP server. And then we, we took the, the XML files, translated them, stored them in the database, and then built a graphical database on top. And that took a few months. So that would really, uh, was really like a lot of time wasted for no real value. And uh, what we can achieve with a unified graphical data layer is uh, that we build adapters for commonly used protocols like so GRPC, OData, et cetera, and we just make them available to one single layer. And what we can also do is through concepts like, for example, uh, schema stitching, we can take those schemas and stitch them together so that with a single graphical query, you can actually query multiple services and join the data on the fly. Uh, this is also one concept we implement in, in Wundergraph. So for example, uh, so far we have adapters uh, that support graphical, graphical federation, graphical schema stitching, as well as REST. So you can take all those together. And in the future, we want to uh, support more, like for example, uh, SOAP, GRPC, and OData, uh, so that you can very easily access all your data from one single place. OK, so yeah, intention is not to remove business log logic, but rather to reduce the time uh, for or the time in the project uh, you spend on non-critical parts. So what you really want to do to enable like new business is build that new application and not middleware or another backend for front end to join or cast, uh, to manually join data from different data sources. Mm. <sighs> okay, number seven is the last one and also the, the biggest topic it's about scaling, performance, and caching. So uh, if you know me already, you, you know that uh, I sometimes uh, write a blog post here and there. And uh, I I really love to touch uh, topics that might be a bit um, like, uh, yeah, uh, not everybody uh, everywhere is seeing. And so what I did recently is write a blog post about Kafka is not meant to be exposed over the internet. It wasn't that well received by Reddit. And I think I, I learned my lesson here because um, I think I wasn't like exactly clear on, on what I actually mean. And so today I want to go a bit more into detail what I actually mean and uh, why I think it makes sense. So uh, one piece of advice I want to give is if you want to be to become more proficient with GraphQL, learn more about REST. So something that I learned is once I learned more about the various API styles, not, not just REST, but in general, like all the API styles and how they work and why people decided on something, uh, it really helps you better understand when to use GraphQL and when not, and what's the pros and what's the cons. And you're in a, in a much better spot uh, for uh, potential discussions because you're, you're not biased too much towards uh, on one side. And so what I want to do when it comes to performance, uh, I want to do a short comparison uh, between GraphQL and REST, but not in the way you usually know them. Because so what I usually see is when, when, when you read the next blog post on GraphQL versus REST, 
what people usually do is like they present the whole thing in a way that GraphQL and REST are two completely different things. And uh, so what I did here is I took from uh, Roy Fieldings from his uh, dissertation uh, uh, where he also introduced REST. I took uh, the, the principles from there. You see that on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, we have the, the various levels of maturity uh, from the Richardson uh, maturity model, uh, which tell you something about uh, how mature your REST API is. And I try to, to figure out, uh, so this is opinionated, of course, this is my opinion. And then I uh, try to figure out, OK, how does GraphQL fit into the picture? Uh, so here are the, the results. So the, the outer blue circle, that's uh, a REST API. Uh, and then we have the, the, red, um, the red surface, that's a GraphQL. And then uh, Wunder Graph, that's orange. But let's first focus on uh, GraphQL and REST. OK, so you see, uh, one of the concepts is uh, you, you want to have a client service, a client server model, which GraphQL actually has. Uh, you want the operations to be stateless. So uh, mutations and queries, obviously, they are stateless. Um, subscriptions over WebSockets, not so much, because you, you initiate, initiate that uh, initial upstream uh, uh, upgrade request, and then you send those like start and stop uh, JSON payloads to initiate or stop a um, a subscription. So that's not really stateless. And then uh, the next point is caching, and you see I reduced the 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 points here for for GraphQL quite a lot, and that is not because you cannot cache GraphQL, but in terms of how can you leverage uh, publicly available RFCs implemented by browsers, intermediate caches, uh, and CDNs, etc. And here's the here's the the point: like you you can have application caches in your GraphQL server, and you can have a normalized cache in your GraphQL client. But in terms of how can you leverage existing infrastructure, is actually quite poor. Um, and uh, next two, those are not that interesting. It's uniform interface and layered system. That's very well uh, supported. Uh, then we have code on demand. It's not really like it doesn't really have any to do anything to do with with GraphQL. I mean, you you could have uh, a Next.js application that loads more more chunks of JavaScript, but it has nothing to do with uh, GraphQL itself. Uh, then we have representations in both, uh, like, you know, you have uh, types and that kind of stuff. And then if we head over to the Richardson maturity model, uh, level zero, that's RPC. So obviously, uh, GraphQL supports that. And level two, resources. Yeah, that's the tricky part, because in GraphQL, we don't really have resources, but we have types. And I feel like this is more like an implementation detail, like, yeah, I don't know. Do you, what's the difference between an endpoint and a and a type? Like, yeah, I, I know technically there's a difference, but um, from a uh, from a usability point of view, it really isn't. And the next one is is verbs. Uh, we use various verbs uh, to implement level two uh, for REST APIs and GraphQL. Obviously, we we just use post requests usually. Uh, so, yeah, it's not really making use of verbs, but I don't see a problem with that. The final point is uh, hypermedia controls, and this is something completely ignored by GraphQL. And I think if you have an application where you really want to have hypermedia controls, then you should definitely just avoid GraphQL. So uh, I've actually never seen any applications that really benefited from that approach. Maybe I'm, I'm yeah. Uh, I just wasn't in the right company to to find that. I what I read about hypermedia controls is that's quite hard to to actually get it right, and most people avoid it. So uh, I feel like maybe just most applications just don't need that. Okay, and now that we have this kind of overview, the question is, um, how can we fill 
those gaps that make sense. So for example, I would really have to have resources and I would really like to have a stateless uh, request response system. And I really want to leverage uh, the cache infrastructure that the, the web already has to offer. For example, really making use of the, the browser cache and not having to implement my own custom normalized cache. And this is what we did with, uh, with WonderGraph. So uh, we're filling the gaps. And the question is, how do we actually do that? And so what, what we did is that we take GraphQL and code generation to fix those gaps or to phrase it a bit differently as a question, can you use GraphQL during development and generate the rest in production? Or to just modify it a slight bit more, can you use GraphQL during development and generate REST in production? And that's actually what we're doing. Uh, and so what I want to do is talk a bit about the evolution of GraphQL clients. And that is a link back to uh, why I think GraphQL is not meant to be exposed over the internet. And that's because when Facebook uh, used or is using, I, I'm actually not sure, but uh, uh, when they used GraphQL, they always had Relay Client. And Relay Client compiled all the GraphQL queries at compile time uh, into hashes. So at runtime, they always had kind of implicit REST endpoints because they, they already compiled um, the queries. So I'm, I'm not sure they did that in Tenfold. But of course, they, they wanted to, to keep the dynamic aspect of GraphQL out of production. So they had that from the start. And then came Apollo, and they said, oh, uh, no, we, we do differently. We have a very, very smart GraphQL client that can handle GraphQL, and we use post requests to send GraphQL queries over the wire, which is totally fine. And I would call that model hybrid because uh, they say, like, by default, you send GraphQL requests over a post, but you have the option to persist queries in some way, and you could then also use persistent queries. But because, uh, in general, it's allowed to send GraphQL queries as post requests, I call that hybrid. And the, the third generation, that is uh, the approach we took at Wundergraph is during development, you use GraphQL. And then once you have the compile time step, we use a code generator and we create a micro gateway for all your queries. And what we do is we take the queries you write, for example, you write them in graphical, and then we have a code gen and we generate the client so there is no smart GraphQL client because it, in production, we just have REST and we make it explicit. And that has a large amount of benefits, OK? So how would that workflow look like in real life? So uh, we already spoke about the uh, artifact package manager for your GraphQL schema. So you want to create a new application. You install those dependencies, like I have my review service and I have my um, comment service, and I want to also add Stripe, so I also install Stripe. Then you write your queries during development. It just works like that. Like during development, you get, can just uh, send um, uh, regular queries to your dev gateway. And then once you ship that application, we compile it all together, create a type safe REST client, and put your queries, like for each query, we create an endpoint on a micro gateway. And then we're basically done. And with that, what we also do is we use HTTP2 streams instead of WebSocket subscriptions. So we don't manually multiplex Web, uh, uh, GraphQL subscriptions over a WebSocket connection. 
uh, which is a lot of overhead. Instead, for each individual subscription, we just create a new HTTP two stream, and that goes over one single TCP connection, so it's very efficient. And the last thing is, because we are using REST in production, uh, we can make use of ETEX and the stale by revalidate pattern. It's a very popular pattern uh, used a lot by Next.js. And with that, you can actually be like super efficient in uh, fetching and refetching data. So looking back at the gaps we had to fill, you can now see that uh, we filled the, the stateless gap, we filled the cache gap. Uh, we still don't care about code on demand. Uh, we are still at level zero RPC, but now because we create a resource or an endpoint, a rest endpoint for each query, uh, we actually reach level one uh, for the resources. Uh, we still don't really use that many verbs. So for queries, we use get, and for sub subscriptions, we use get as well. Uh, like it's just an HTTP two stream. And for uh, mutations, obviously we use posts because otherwise caches would not be able to, like intermediate caches would not be able to deal with that. And uh, we still ignore hypermedia because if that's what you want, you definitely don't want to use any of what I said before. Um, okay, so that's one part of the story. But another part is uh, compiled graphical operations. Uh, so when performance is one of your concerns, uh, what I figured is that the uh, Node.js runtime is actually a very, very, very bad fit for um, high throughput, high concurrency workloads. And an API gateway that wants to stitch together schemas and uh, implements federation actually is a high throughput, high concurrency job. So currently, we only have uh, the Node.js implementation by Apollo that does that. And uh, so uh, what most, if not all, graphical implementation have in common is that they interpret graphical at runtime. So that means the query comes in, and they lex the query, they pass it, they do all the things. And that's very, very costly. And in a memory managed language, like for example, Node.js, it also means a lot of garbage collection and that makes the whole thing extremely slow. So what we do instead is we take your graphical operations at compile time because we're creating those endpoints and we compile them to very, very efficient code so that at runtime, we don't even do any graphical related stuff. We just execute a graph and that is a lot more efficient uh, when we compare that to a regular GraphQL server. So on the left-hand side, you can see a regular GraphQL server. So it has to do the lexing. You have to parse, normalize, validate, enforce field level authorization, calculate the complexity, enforce rate limiting, blah, 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 and do all that stuff, like all these 13 steps. And then on the right-hand side, because we, we do all those things at compile time already, all we have to do is we take the, the ready-made query plan, send the upstream request to the upstreams, fetch and merge the response and give it back. And so uh, what we initially uh, saw in our early testing is that if we compare that, for example, against uh, the uh, Apollo Gateway, we saw a 37 to 150x improvement in, in throughput, so queries per second. And then the, the Node.js, uh, process was really overwhelmed by the concurrency. So uh, latency was above uh, one second uh, for in the 99th percentile. And we were able to reduce that to sub millisecond. So I think that kind of speaks for itself. Uh, we're not yet ready for production. We did not yet release it. But if you're interested in, in uh, that kind of stuff, um, you can follow us on, on Twitter, for example, or read. Uh, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, and then you get updated once we have that ready. So putting all the things together um, that I presented throughout this talk is, um, as an API provider, what you do if you, are, if you buy into 
uh, this this kind of mantra is you develop APIs and push your artifacts into some kind of system. You have your CI system uh, that prevents you from uh, breaking clients, but allows you to do breaking changes. And you have your CI that helps you to keep your uh, schema consistent and not declare like the eighth vehicle type. And on the other hand, as an API consumer, uh, you can import all your uh, API artifacts for one particular application that you're currently building. Uh, you write your queries, you generate a type safe client, and then once you deploy the whole thing into production, you get a tiny micro gateway that's kind of your REST backend for front end, and then you're basically done. So what's the whole uh, return on invest on, on this approach? Uh, it's basically, you have that one repository where you manage all your APIs, you get that single source of, of truth. You can combat schema inconsistencies with linters and your CI system. Uh, you allow API providers to move fast because they are allowed to, to break something. Um, we talked about monitoring where you can get rid of old systems and uh, you reduce the amount of custom middleware that's required. Okay, so in the end, uh, you get the developer experience of GraphQL combined with the strength of REST in production. And you might be asking what's ahead of us in 2021. And so what I'd like to predict is that uh, in 2021, the concept of GraphQL and the schema package manager, that's really rocket fuel for the API con community. Um, we can reduce integration costs if we can connect graphs across teams and organizations. And I think if we build that kind of layer, this is the enabler for the next generation of uh, software as a service businesses, because people who want to build the next Stripe, they get it a lot easier because the, the entry burden is a lot lower. Uh, so if you found that interesting and want to follow along uh, in the future, uh, again, this is my uh, handle. Jens Neuse underscore de and monograph.com, and you can have a look at the blog. And to uh, find an end, uh, I also want to introduce uh, a project which we open source today. Um, so uh, this is the Wundergraph Hopper, and that's our open source graphical extension or our new interpretation of, of graphical uh, graphical it's based on monaco editor and what we try to achieve is uh, with that really make it easier for people to write the graphical queries uh, based on the user experience that you know from uh, vs code so have a look at hopper monograph.com to just try it out live and the oss project is on github would be very nice to uh, get your feedback and create an issue if you find a bug. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's time for Jess to come back. Jess, are you still there? I am. <laughs> I guess, I do. Doing good. Some delays there in the interface. Oh, but, I see. Uh, yeah. So, uh, fantastic talk. I mean, really, the technology is new enough that it affords the opportunities for these kind of questions early on before we all go crazy down one path or another. It's an important question to ask about what's the right way to really be utilizing GraphQL. Does it really belong on the front end or does it belong somewhere in between or somewhere between the services in the back end? So it's, um, yeah, a really great question. We have a couple from the audience. Uh, we have one terrible pun uh, from Potik. Uh, wunderbar, uh, Jens. So I think there's a, a wunderbar um, pun. Yeah. But, uh, so the question was, let's see here. 
So one of the first questions was, does pairing a graph database like Neo4j with GraphQL give any advantages? Uh, can you repeat that? Does pairing a graph, uh, does pairing a graph database with GraphQL have any advantages? Well, it depends. I mean, if you already have the database and you can join it together with the different services, uh, and then you can on the fly, like for example, you have the database, you have some legacy SOAP API, you join them together using schema stitching, and now you can write a query to get data from, from both on the fly. That could definitely eliminate some uh, writing and hosting and operating some malware. So it could be beneficial, sure. Somebody is asking if you have a, a live demo of Hopper running. Uh, yeah, hopper.wondergraph.com. Very cool. Um, any other questions? I think the graph question maybe was even meant for another speaker, so I'm not totally sure there. But um, any other questions for Jens? I think um, one thing you said in the beginning, and I think uh, you're making a good point here, is um, and I also also heard uh, Tanmai from uh, Hasura say a similar thing. I currently have the feeling that graphical is kind of an intermediate API style. So maybe it's not the right place to expose GraphQL to the client, but it's very, a very, very powerful developer experience during development, but maybe just not in production. And I think it's, it's a question of finding the right, the right tooling and enabling that kind of workflow. Because if you look back, for example, at how Facebook used GraphQL itself, they always had GraphQL together with Relay. It was never that they directly exposed that. And I guess they made it for a reason. And now we're going a completely different direction with the way Apollo proposed. And that creates a whole bunch of new problems we need to solve. Not that it's the wrong way. Maybe we just have to be very cautious of which direction we go. Or it could be back to the question of depends. Uh, it depends. Uh, depends on what you're building, right? So, in certain contexts, the especially at scale, focusing on encapsulation and individual components, declaring its data dependencies, uh, uh, aka the the relay approach, becomes really powerful because then you can pick and pull these components around and not necessarily care about the data dependencies. Um, yeah. But when you're talking about something maybe that's more user driven, like a user is able to sort of dynamically generate dashboard utilities, maybe there's some benefits to having a, a layer or, but yeah, it's a really fascinating question. I think that it requires more than just taking the, uh, the repo or the demo examples and running with them. You need yeah. to really check to see what your, your use case is going to be. Uh, fantastic talk. I'm going to give everybody time to migrate over to the uh, last talk of the day, which is uh, on the main stage, and it's going to be the innovation delusion. I want to say thanks again to Jens for uh, the talk. It was really great, kind of a nice wrap up and a really great question to kind of finish the year with going into next year as well from the API days conferences. Um, yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic wrap up to GraphQL track and uh, appreciate having you here. Jesse, thank you for having me.